Perhaps my favorite part of the Easter Vigil is the singing of the Exultant. Great song that we sing not long after we process into the church. And the name Exultant comes from the first word of that song. We sing Exult, let them exult the hosts of heaven. And last year I sang this for the first time. It's quite a long uh, piece of music. It takes about 10 to 13 minutes depending on how quickly you go. And so I had to practice quite a bit. No music played with it. It's pretty uh, intense. And as I'm practicing it, uh, one of the times I was going through it, I guess I was paying more attention to it than I did the other times. But I had to stop as I was singing. I had to pause the video that I was using to practice because I got choked up. I was overwhelmed with emotion. My Somebody must have been cutting onions because my eyes started to water a little bit. And so I had to stop and compose myself. And the line that got to me was this. O wonder of your humble care for us. O love, O charity beyond all telling. To ransom a slave, you gave away your son. And so this is precisely what our readings this week ask us to reflect upon. In that first reading, we heard the very familiar story of Abraham and Isaac. God speaks to Abraham and asks him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Um, And if you're like me, this particular passage has always been a little troubling. Uh, Why would God ask this, right? Uh, Why would, how would their relationship be after this, right? Uh, Dad, you tried to slaughter me. I'm probably not going to go back home, right? But what helped me to understand it was when I learned that Isaac was a bit older when this scene occurred. He would have been a teenager, maybe even older. And so he willingly offered, was going to willingly offer himself as a sacrifice, right? He wasn't being, it wasn't being imposed on him by his father. Um, And there's strong images in this episode that we hear that point to what is going to happen many years later, right? What happens with Jesus. Uh, Abraham is to offer, we hear, his only son whom he loves. Now, God did not allow Abraham to carry this out, but what happened? Right? Instead, he sent his only son, Jesus, whom he loved, right? His beloved, and he sent him to be a sacrifice instead of Isaac. One of the parts that's left out of the reading today uh, is when Abraham sees the place where God has led him, sees the place where he's supposed to go and offer sacrifice. He leaves the servants and the animals behind, and uh, Abraham and Isaac go by themselves on foot to the place where they are. he is to offer this sacrifice. And so as they're going, they have to carry everything they need. And as he begins to unload the animals, he loads the wood onto his son Isaac. He carries the wood that is going to be used for the sacrifice to the place. Years later, Jesus carries the wood of the cross, right? The wood upon which he is going to offer himself as a sacrifice to Golgotha. He carries it up the mountain, just like Isaac had carried the wood for his sacrifice. As they're walking, Isaac, a very intuitive young man, asks his father, where is the sheep for the sacrifice? And Abraham responds that God himself will supply the sheep. God himself did, in fact, supply the sheep. Again, years later, he gave us not just any sheep, but Jesus. Right? The spotless lamb of God. The one who would take away the sins of the world. And so we see in that first reading a lot of images that foreshadow the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The second reading also calls our mind to these ideas. St. Paul, writing to the Romans, says this, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, how will he not also give us everything else along with him? I used to use this idea in the confessional a lot in my early days as a priest. 
Right? People would come in and be burdened with their sins. They would wonder how God could love them, how God could give them uh, any good gifts because of what they had done. And this was my response. In fact, I would give it out as a penance, right? Go and pray with this passage. Right? And I'd point to the cross and say, God did that. Right? God gave us his beloved son. Why would he hold anything else back? What good could he gain from holding back anything? What does he have that's worth holding back? He's given us the most precious thing he possibly could, his son. The fathers of the church wrote very eloquently of this idea, and they called it the great or the glorious exchange. Right? That is the fact that Jesus was sent to die for us in our place. Right? We were the ones that had sinned. We were the ones that had committed that uh, offense against God. And because we offended God, it was an infinite sin. Right? God is infinitely good, and so to offend Him is an infinite uh, sin. And so the reparation needed to be infinite. But we're finite, right? We can't do that. And so God had to send His only Son to offer himself in our place, right? But he also had to be human because it had to be offered for us. And so he had to be human so that the sacrifice that he made of himself counted for us, took, part, took place for us. We should have been punished, but Jesus came to suffer in our place. Right? That is the glorious exchange. Again, in the words of the exalted, to ransom a slave, you gave away your son. We were the slaves. Right? Just like Israel was in slavery in Egypt, we were enslaved to sin. And so Jesus came to offer himself as a ransom for our sake, to set us free from sin. So how does this apply to Lent? Well, look at the gospel. In the Gospel, we have the great scene of the Transfiguration. Right? Jesus takes his inner circle of the apostles, Peter, James, and John. He brings them up to a high mountain with him. And he shows them himself in all of his glory. And revealing his glory does a couple of things. It reveals his divinity to his apostles. It assures them that he really is God. It strengthens them. It confirms their faith in his divinity, which they had already confessed. And this strength that they receive from this experience prepares them for what is to come. And the strength that they receive will help them through the pain that they're going to experience of the passion, the death, and the crucifixion of Jesus. Moses and Elijah, we hear, appear with Jesus, and it makes that connection between what's going on there and the Old Testament. Right? Jesus is that fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so Moses and Elijah appearing there with him reminds them of this fact. Peter, James, and John, again, as we do, hear, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And it brings them, it brings us, back to that first reading. Right? They were good Jews. They would have known the Scriptures. They would have remembered this, and hearing this statement would have reminded them of what we heard, right? Of the fact that Abraham had been willing to sacrifice his son, but that God had stopped. That he himself would supply the sheep for the sacrifice. And God would soon complete that glorious exchange with Jesus giving himself as the ultimate self-gift, giving himself on the wood of the cross that sacrifice to end all sacrifices. So as we continue on this Lenten journey, we say with St. Peter, Lord, it is good that we are here. It's good that we're here to prepare our hearts for the celebration of the high point of the church year with the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. It's good that we are here to be reminded of that glorious exchange. It is good that we are here to be reminded of just how much God loves us. That to ransom us, 
To ransom me, a slave, he gave away his son. And so let us continue to come back here to this mountain, this privileged place of encounter with the Almighty, asking God for the grace to live as worthy sons and daughters of such a great and loving Father.